The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. That lasts forever Know His hope And sure salvation I will trust in Him Oh, the world falls around me I rest and know That He has found me Christ, the rock, is my Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album, Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Iesus. The English transliteration for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. As stated in an earlier episode discussing types and shadows, when we study all of Scripture, we tend to see that indeed God seems to create all things according to a pattern which testifies of Him. As we continue to look and study the visible and invisible things of creation, we are able to increasingly see God's reflection to some degree in that mirror. When these examples occur within Scripture, we characteristically refer to them as types or shadows. We shall also see that ultimately, as with all Scripture, that these types and shadows point to the substance, which is Jesus. In this episode, we continue our study of types and shadows with the story of Moses the Deliverer. Let's pray. Father, I pray that as we open the body of your word sent out from you from all eternity, that your word which created and sustains all things which have been made would come alive to quicken our hearts, minds, and spirits. I pray that as we study the various types and shadows of Moses the Deliverer, that you would reveal the substance. We pray that listening we might hear, hearing we might receive, and receiving, we might understand and fully comprehend the boundless love that you have for those who will, by your grace, through faith, become your sons and daughters by adoption. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, in terms of Moses being a type, casting a greater shadow, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15 where Moses makes a curious announcement which deserves careful consideration. Quote, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him shall ye hearken. Unquote. From this and other verses, like 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, 
we are reminded that all scripture is God breathed and that we are given the challenge by Jesus himself, according to John chapter 5, verse 39, which says, quote, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Unquote. This admonition to search the scriptures carries the clear implication that all scripture potentially, if not emphatically, holds some truth which testifies about Jesus. Consequently, it behooves each of us, as like the Bereans, to undertake and remain prayerfully engaged in searching and studying scripture for these truths, which serves as the types for the substances which testifies of him. Even more pertinently, in John chapter 5, verses 45 through 47, Jesus says the following, quote, Do not think I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe in my words? Unquote. If we look at Moses' prophecy in Deuteronomy, in connection to the statements of Jesus in John chapter 5, verse 39, and in John chapter 5, verses 45 through 47, it is clear that Moses' life is prime territory in which to search for such a type. This being said, let us raise the curtain on Moses' life to see the substance casting the shadow. Perhaps the first thing we need to do is to set the stage and to introduce the primary backdrop for this episode, Egypt. Now, in a general sense, most Bible commentaries and scholars are in agreement that Egypt is the type of the world held captive under the effects of sin, rebellion, and separation. Depending on the exact time frame in question, and which scholar one wants to listen to, there were anywhere from several hundred to several thousand gods, goddesses, and or deities known and or worshipped by the Egyptians. There was a god for almost every occasion. Egypt's gods were represented in innumerable ways by both animals and symbols. To complicate matters, each pharaoh was considered to be a god unto himself and brought with him his own ideas about who and or what were considered gods to be worshipped. As a result, Egypt's pantheon of gods was constantly changing and growing. Contrast this with the monotheistic faith of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and his sons, who comprised God's chosen people, Israel. The second interesting consideration for our type are the dynamics of the Israelites' entry, integration, assimilation, enslavement, and ultimate exodus from Egypt. We have already identified and can agree that Egypt is the type of the world and of sin in general. Conversely, Abraham, and by extension his descendants, were called out by God from among Abraham's people to be God's people. From that point forward, Abraham and his descendants began their journey following God's lead to become a countless people who would obtain God's promise to inherit the lands. Up until Jacob's time, with some temporary setbacks, Jacob and his predecessors had generally been making progress towards the promise in question. Let us recall that prior to entering Egypt, Jacob, who became renamed Israel, had twelve sons who became the individual respective fathers, heads, and namesakes of the twelve tribes, later referred to collectively by the name Israel. While these twelve tribes were and still remain divinely and distinctively blessed as God's promised people, they are also nonetheless types in part of God's people who are called out, including Christ's bride, the church. With these preliminary types in mind, let's take an overview look at the substantive meaning of Israel's involvement with Egypt. To begin with, there are several legitimate reasons and or theories as to why Israel found themselves in Egypt. Firstly, 
The answer in the final analysis, like everything else in life, is that God is sovereign and he does as he pleases according to his perfect will. Secondly, were we to look to scripture, we could safely take the inspired word of God spoken in Genesis chapter 50 verse 20, where Joseph tells his brothers, quote, But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive, unquote. In other words, God knew that seven years of serious famine was coming upon the land where Israel lived. In order to keep his promise, God elected to place Joseph into a position of power and authority. Further, God organized events so that Israel could be moved to Egypt where they could be sheltered by Joseph with provision while the famine was underway. While this is clearly God's record on the matter, it does not negate the fact that there may be other reasons God had for this historical saga. For example, prior to this episode, we know that those who were Abraham's descendants were a small group of perhaps 70 or so people. Although the Israelites had spent over 200 years in Egypt and endured bondage and suffering, They also multiplied during that time in bondage to a population of around 1 to 2 million people. Essentially, the initial fertile environment of Egypt under the command of Joseph allowed Israel to become the formidable power that they were and more quickly fulfill God's promise to Abraham. All of these and perhaps others are valid reasons for the episode of Egypt. However, I would submit that this episode also carries the basic overall model for sin and salvation. In the beginning, as we see Israel and his sons, we see the type of God's people whom he is calling to be separated by faith from the world to the eventual promised land, i.e. heaven. At first, Israel and his family live comfortably and happily outside the influence of, of Egypt. One would logically believe that if Egypt had been a more spiritually positive place to live than where they were, then Israel and his family would have been moved there long before it became necessary and unavoidable. It was only as the famine was beginning that food scarcity drove Israel to trade money for grain with Egypt. Thus, In our analogy, the first stage of our type model is the fact that, generally speaking, God's desire is for as many as would to hear his call and respond to faith to him. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9 says it this way, quote, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, unquote or the classic John chapter 3, verse 16, which says, quote, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, unquote. So at the same time, while God's Spirit is seeking to draw and save as many as who will respond by faith and be separate from the world and sin, we have the corresponding reality that the power of sin, typified by Egypt, is also there. Here, we see God's people Israel, who initially are outside Egypt pursuing God's promise. Like our story, it is not uncommon for those who strive to be outside Egypt to find practical reasons to trade with Egypt, and thus become entangled peripherally with Egypt. Once trade has begun with Egypt, an increasing comfort builds, and eventually, like Israel, those outside Egypt now find the incentive, rationale, and the invitation to move into and become part of Egypt. Thus, entering and living in Egypt, just like sin, is easy to justify for practical reasons. Often, in the initial stages, the advantages of living in Egypt can seem to outweigh the disadvantages. However, like in Israel's case, over time, 
what began as simple trade for practical reasons with Egypt, develops into gradual dependency and eventually gives way to bondages to the forces of sin. Once God's people are completely captive to slavery of Egypt, there is no longer any freedom, power, or ability to leave. What is now necessary is delivery from Egypt in order to resume the journey again to the Promised Land. This completed overview saga of Egypt is the microcosm type which is the substance of sin and redemption. Enter our required deliverer type for this episode, Moses. If we turn to Exodus chapter 1 verse 8, we learn that as a new pharaoh took the throne of Egypt, the new pharaoh had grave concerns about the apparent fact that at this point the people of Israel had grown larger in numbers and strength than the Egyptians. As a result, Egypt's pharaoh set taskmasters over the Israelites to afflict them. Despite this, the Israelites continued to increase in size and strength. In verse 15, Pharaoh took the next step, which was to instruct the Hebrew midwives to kill any male children born to the Israelites and save the female children. When this failed, Pharaoh ordered that every male child born should be cast into the river, and every female shall be saved alive. In chapter 2, we next learn that two Israelites named Jochebed and Amram had a child together whom they hid from Pharaoh for three months. After three months, Jochebed placed the child into an ark and set the ark by the river's bank. Eventually, as Miriam watched, the child was rescued from the death intended by Pharaoh by Pharaoh's daughter. At this point, we should pause to recognize the substance represented by the type. First, it is important to understand that Moses' parents, Jochebed and Amram, were from the tribe of Levi. While the common misconception is that all of the Israelites fell into bondage, the truth is that the tribe of Levi, unlike the rest of the Israelites' tribes, did not fall into the trap of slavery during the time they were in Egypt. Instead, it appears that according to rabbinic tradition, the tribe of Levi spent their time studying the will of God. If this is the case, then the first thing we see is that Levi is the type of God's people who, despite being physically in the midst of Egypt, remain separate, called out, and have not bowed their knee and become part of the rebellion and sin of Egypt, which enslaves them. Paul, in Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 5, comments on the substance of this type this way, quote, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. What ye not what scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace." Unquote. So in this case, we find Jochebed and Amram, who are of the tribe of Levi, who have kept themselves separate from the bondage and myriad idol worship and sin of Egypt. Like these two, Mary and Joseph, were also godly. Matthew chapter 1 verse 16 records that Joseph was a righteous man. Mary describes herself as a bond slave of the Lord. Second, we find out that Jochebed was, in fact, one of the midwives of Egypt who, according to Exodus chapter 1, verse 17, feared God. This fact also explains in part why, upon finding Moses, Pharaoh's daughter brings Moses to Jochebed for her to serve as his nurse. Next, we have Exodus chapter 2, verse 2, which comments on the birth of Moses this way, quote, 
And the woman, Jochebed, conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months, unquote. At first glance, this verse seems merely to comment on the fact that the son, i.e. Moses, was a quote-unquote goodly child. The question is, are we talking about two parents who are simply enamored like any parent of their cute newborn baby? Or is there more than meets the eye? In one rabbinic tradition, we find that apparently both parents recognized at this point that Moses was filled with the Shekinah glory of God. In our type comparison, surely it is not difficult to see a correlation with the statement made in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, which says, quote, For in him, referring to Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, unquote. If we compare Moses' life with that of Jesus, we see several astonishing correlations between the type, i.e. Moses, and the substance, i.e. Jesus. To begin with, as previously stated in both instances, God's people were in bondage. During Moses' time, Egypt was the culprit. During Jesus' time, Rome was responsible. The common denominator between both was that both empires were kingdoms under the sway of sin, ruled ultimately by Satan. Second, comparing Exodus chapter 1 verse 22 and Matthew chapter 2 verse 16, both Pharaoh and King Herod were both so concerned about their respective kingdoms that each issued orders to kill all male children in an ultimate effort to prevent those children from providing deliverance to their people. So in the end, Pharaoh tried to kill Moses, while Herod tried to kill Jesus. Third, comparing Exodus chapter 2 verse 2 and Matthew chapter 2 verse 13, both Moses and Jesus escaped and were hidden from Pharaoh's and Herod's decrees by their parents. Fourth, comparing Exodus chapter 2, verse 2 through 4, and Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, both Moses and Jesus had their lives preserved from Pharaoh and or Herod by escaping to Egypt. Next, we have Exodus chapter 2, verse 3, which says, quote, and when she could no longer hide him, she took him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch, and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's bank." Unquote. Remember, Moses is the type of deliverance from the bondage of sin embodied in this case by Egypt. In the greater scheme of things, since Jesus is the substance of this type, then Jesus is the substance casting the shadow which was Moses. Here in this verse, Moses, the type of deliverance, is placed into an ark. As we saw in the episode entitled The Ark of Noah, the ark was its clear type of salvation through faith, through its substance, Jesus. Here, even in a mere utilitarian sense, the ark constructed for Moses was designed clearly to provide salvation from death due to Pharaoh's decree, as well as protection from the dangers of the River Nile where the ark was placed. Ultimately, we see that Moses' placement inside the ark demonstrates and points to the greater reality that deliverance and salvation, i.e. Moses, is initiated by placing all hope for one's deliverance and salvation inside the ark, i.e. Jesus, who is that ark. After Moses and the ark are placed in the river, Pharaoh's daughter soon thereafter discovers the ark and becomes the instrument of Moses' rescue, despite her father, Pharaoh, being the instrument of Moses' destruction. As if there was a coincidence, Pharaoh's daughter, who was apparently childless, saw Moses and immediately decided to adopt Moses as her own and named him. In this regard, Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted Moses, parallels Joseph, who adopted Jesus as his own, and named him. Eventually, after Pharaoh's daughter gave Moses to Jochebed to nurse her own son, Jochebed returns Moses to Pharaoh's daughter, at which point Moses becomes the son of Pharaoh's daughter. 
Interestingly, from Exodus chapter 2, verse 9, where Moses is nursed by Jochebed, until Exodus chapter 2, verse 11, where Moses becomes the son of Pharaoh's daughter and is grown, there is no mention or details of Moses' life. This period of historical silence matches the historical silence regarding the details of Jesus' life between his childhood and the beginning of his earthly ministry. Without doubt, the larger substance casting the type is this. Both Moses and Jesus left their original estate to enter the world of sin and thereby deliver those who will by faith follow them to the promised land, i.e. heaven. Further, it appears evident that since Moses was adopted and raised by Pharaoh's daughter, Moses would have the immediate access, rights, and use to all of the riches that Egypt had to offer. Since Moses was the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter, he would have been, for all intent purposes, a prince, royalty, and potentially in the line of succession as a ruler, even Pharaoh himself. This fact also corresponds with the rights and privileges Jesus held according to Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Quote, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, unquote. Given the type, we see Moses could have easily focused his efforts and energy on being Pharaoh. In this case, being Pharaoh would be equivalent to being God, since the Pharaoh and the Egyptians thought of Pharaoh as such. In the substance of our type, Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 makes the connection to Jesus by saying of Jesus, quote, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, unquote. Yet, despite the fact that both Moses and Jesus had a claim to the throne of royalty, each ultimately preferred otherwise for a greater purpose. In the case of Moses, the New Testament book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 24, comments, saying, quote, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, unquote. In the case of Jesus, Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8 continues, saying, quote, But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made into the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, unquote. Moving forward in Exodus chapter 2, Two, verse 11 and 12, we read, and it, quote, and it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand, unquote. In this verse, we see the type of Jesus who, like Moses, grew in the fullness of time to manhood and began his ministry. In both cases, Moses and Jesus left their right in a state of privilege, royalty, and kingship and preference for hardship and servanthood for the greater purpose to go out, join their brethren, their people, their kindred, and thereby deliver them from their bondage, sin, i.e. Egypt. Both Moses and Jesus beheld the reality that their people, God's people, were in bondage to Egypt, i.e. sin, and that in fact sin, personified by the Egyptian in Moses' case, was beating his brethren. Had Moses looked the other way, the original text language which uses the word smiting suggests that the Egyptian was intent on killing the Hebrew. This insight on the attempted murder of God's chosen by the Egyptian and the subsequent rescue by Moses and by extension Jesus, who is the substance, fulfills the commentary made in Romans chapter 6 verse 23, quote, For the wages of sin is death, 
but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, unquote. As Moses conquered and slew the Egyptian, Jesus conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave. Jesus took our sin and our penalty of death upon himself. Through grace, by faith in him, he thereby buries all of our sin, past, present, and future, in the grave, i.e. the sand, where our sin, like the Egyptian, is forever hidden from his eyes. Consequently, the type thus far perfectly demonstrates the intended ministry, mission, and goal of Jesus as Messiah to his people Israel. Like Moses, Jesus had the power, desire, and ability to deliver their respective people from their bondage. You would think that having taken this risky step of having rescued the Hebrew by killing the Egyptian, that the Hebrew and the others would be thankful and grateful. Instead, we find verse 13 and 14 to explain the reaction to Moses' behavior. Quote, and when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together, and he said to him that did wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me, as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known, unquote. If verses 11 and 12 demonstrate the love of God's heart to abandon the riches, power, and position of the majesty of God's throne and humble himself by taking on the form of a servant to redeem his people, then verses 13 and 14 surely describe the reaction, reality, and tragedy recorded by John chapter 1, verse 11. Quote, he came to his own, and his own received him not. Unquote. Jesus came as Messiah to save his people from their sins, to reconcile God and man, to breach the separation between the two, and restore peace between God and man. In this context, we see why Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 gives Jesus the Messiah the title, the Prince of Peace. It is painfully obvious both then and now that peace, whether it be peace between fellow man or peace between man and God, is a commodity in great need. This was the case typified in verse 13 where the two Hebrews, ostensibly God's people, strove together. It was the case in the time of Jesus' earthly ministry, and it is the case still today, wherever you choose to look. Unfortunately, Historically, there is always those who will say to Jesus, just as the Hebrew said to Moses, Who made thee prince and a judge over us? Others will by the grace of God see and understand their condition of bondage to sin, i.e. Egypt. By God's grace, there will be those who will see their need for a deliverer from sin. May God grant that there will continue to be those who turn to Jesus as our Messiah and Deliverer and place their faith and trust in His completed righteousness imputed to them through a relationship with Him. When they do, we have His promise that He heals the breach of separation and creates peace between God and man. This concludes part one of our episode Please join me again for part two. Thank you for listening. Trust in